Hi, hi. I am so excited that we are now on chapter 17 in our novel, Hidden Figures. And if you look at my chapter book, when you have read a book over and over and over, some books, they're not going to look pristine and perfect. But that just shows that I am reading it, I am taking notes, I am thinking about what I am reading to be successful in class. So here I have today um, our chapter, Writing the Textbook on Space. So even though I might be reading a chapter book, I'm actually reading a book that's based on fact. And so even though it's a narrative, a lot of the information that is here is not made up. It is based on facts from people who have spoken and talked about it in the past. And so let's get started on learning. Before this, there was no textbook on space. There was no NASA. There was no all of the wonderful things that NASA has done over the years. The ladies from NACA actually supported this group that we now know as NASA. So let's get into our story. Writing the textbook on space. The staff at the Langley Research Center had very few resources to teach engineers about outer space. To bring the entire laboratory up to speed, Catherine Goebel's branch chief organized a lecture series to take place from February to May of 1958. He asked his team, the engineers in the flight research and the pilotless aircraft research divisions to present the lectures on a range of topics. From the solar system to problems with re-entry from outer space into Earth's atmosphere, the lectures were a crash course in all things aeronautic. Catherine Goldway loved learning everything she could about space travel. She was delighted when the engineers in her group assigned her the task of preparing charts for use in these space technology lectures. In essence, she was helping the engineers write the first real textbook about outer space. Always curious, Catherine listened to everything her coworkers said. She read every word of Aviation Week, a magazine about flight. She drained every drop of knowledge from the engineer she worked with, but that was not enough. The real action she knew was taking place in the lectures and editorial meetings, those private closed door gatherings where engineers reviewed and discussed the most recent research reports. She wanted to be a part of those talks, but the men in charge would not allow it. A place at the table. Building an airplane was nothing compared to getting research through Langley's grueling literature review process. Present your case. Build it. Sell it so they believe it. That was the Langley way. Authors of a NASA technical report had to talk about their research and give a lot of information to convince everyone that their theory was correct. Then they faced questions from four or five people chosen for their expertise in a topic. Sometimes these questions were really tough. The committee members looked for inaccuracies, inconsistencies, incomprehensible statements, and illogical conclusions in the report. After clearing the technical hurdles, a report went through a style, clarity, and grammatical check. A final report might take months or even years to complete. Catherine Goldway sat down with the engineers to review the requirements for the space technology lectures and the research reports that were coming out of the presentations. She asked lots of questions so that she could completely understand the problem set before her. So you students that ask your teachers lots and lots of questions, 
you're just like Catherine and think about it. The more questions you ask, the more information your brains will be as sponges trying to take in. Why can't I go to the editorial meeting, she asked the engineers. Girls don't go to the meetings, her colleague said. Is there a law against it? She asked. There wasn't, of course. It wasn't personal. The engineers told her it was just the way things had always been done. The no woman rule was a matter of practice, not policy. Langley gave each division chief and branch head the power to manage their own groups. These male bosses decided whether a woman was promoted, if she got a raise, or if she was permitted to attend meetings. Women at Langley had to learn how to work with men. They needed to be polite, but not so polite that they seemed timid. For the most part, men were engineers and women were computers. Men did the analytical thinking and women did the calculations. Men gave the orders and women took the notes. Unless an engineer was given a compelling reason to see a woman as a peer, she remained in his blind spot. Even the smartest woman might get stuck doing repetitive humdrum work unless someone paid attention and gave her a chance. Women like Catherine Gobley found their work interesting, just like the men did. For the women who had found their true calling at NASA, they matched their male colleagues in curiosity, passion, and the ability to withstand pressure. The problem was that women had to get over the high hurdle of low expectations. They needed to prove that they were just as good as men as and should be held to the same standards and given the same opportunities. Whatever personal insecurities Catherine Goble may have had about being a woman, working with men, or about being one of the few blacks in a white workplace, she didn't let them bother her. Male or female, black or white, as far as Catherine was concerned, once she got to the office, they were all the same. Why can't I go to the editorial meetings, Catherine Goble asked again. On this issue, like any other, she kept up the questioning until she received a satisfactory answer. Her request came across as gentle but persistent. She wasn't going to let the issue drop. The greatest adventure in, his, in the history of humankind was happening in the office next door and she wanted to be a part of it. Let her go, one of the men finally said, exasperated. The others agreed, no doubt, tired of saying no. Who were they? They must have figured to stand in the way of a woman so committed to making a contribution. In 1958, Catherine Goway, or Gola, finally made it into the editorial meetings of the guidance and control branch of Langley's Flight Research Division, soon to be renamed the Aerospace Mechanics Division of NASA. She took her place at the table where she knew she belonged. She had a lot to learn and a lot to offer. So hi, this is the end of chapter 17. And I can tell you, it is so encouraging to everyone. Just think about this. You just work really hard, ask a lot of questions, and eventually you will get your seat at the table too. So until next time, hi, keep on reaching for the stars. Bye.